Our next speaker is Stephen Smoot. He's a doctoral candidate in Semitic and Egyptian languages and literature at the Catholic University of America. He previously earned a master's degree from the University of Toronto in Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations with a concentration in Egyptology and a bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University in Ancient Near Eastern Studies with a concentration in Hebrew Bible and German Studies. Uh, he's currently an adjunct instructor of religious education at Brigham Young University. We were just talking and reminding each other that he, he started as a fair volunteer and came to the first conference when he was 17 years old. So he's been with us for a while. So with that, I'd like to turn the time over to Stephen Smoot. Thank you, Scott, for that introduction. Um, let's see, I need a clicker or something for, oh, here it is. Perfect, yes, thank you for the introduction, Scott. I appreciate it. Um, I was happy to speak here two years ago and uh, on that occasion, I spoke on the subject of homosexuality in the Bible. Since that time, I thought, you know, that a topic like that's a little too controversial for a lot of people, very sensitive, very polarizing views on that sort of subject. So I thought for my follow-up talk, I should pick a safe subject that nobody has strong feelings about, nobody fights or argues about. I'll talk about the book of Abraham. So that's what I'm here to talk about. Uh, I, I am very grateful to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, what I want to do today is I want to read uh, from the introduction and the conclusion of a new book slash journal issue that just came out through BYU Studies. Uh, I first have to give a shout out to my co-authors on the book, uh, two of them who are here, John Gee, John Thompson, and Carrie Muelstein uh, helped me on this project. And so all of the bad parts of the book you can blame on them. I did all the good parts, of course. Uh, but I just want to read a little bit from the book and then take your questions afterwards, uh, and we'll see how it goes. The Book of Abraham, let's see, are we going here? Ah, there we go. The Book of Abraham is accepted by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as an inspired or revealed translation of the writings of the biblical patriarch Abraham. Joseph Smith began the translation of the text after he acquired some Egyptian papyrus scrolls and mummies in the summer of 1835. Canonized as scripture by the church in 1880, the book narrates an account of the patriarch's near sacrifice at the hands of his idolatrous kinsfolk, his journey to Canaan, the covenant he entered into with God, and his visions of the premortal world and the creation. Although a short book of only five chapters, the book of Abraham has nevertheless contributed significantly to the restoration, uh, to restoration doctrine, particularly as it pertains to the Latter-day Saint understanding of the Abrahamic covenant, and the concept of the premortal existence of humankind. While Latter-day Saints cherish the Book of Abraham and accept its inspiration on faith, they also have not been afraid to explore the text with scholarly tools in order to better understand it. A pioneering scholar of the Book of Abraham was Hugh Nibley, a former professor of religion at Brigham Young University with academic training in ancient history and languages. Nibley wrote extensively on the Book of Abraham during his career producing several important contributions to the scholarly discussion surrounding this book of scripture. Since Nibley's day, more scholars have turned their gaze to the book of Abraham from a number of different perspectives. The results have been nothing short of remarkable. Scholars have profitably evaluated the historical details of the text with Egyptological, archeological, and linguistic tools. They have read its narrative closely to elucidate literary and poetic patterns. They have clarified its composition and transmission history through textual criticism, and they have explored the rich doctrine of the book. In addition to making compelling arguments for the historicity of the Book of Abraham, uh, as well as its narrative coherence and theological profundity, Nibley and other scholars have also argued that elements of Joseph Smith's interpretation of the three facsimiles accompanying the text find plausible legitimacy as knowledge of ancient Egypt and other ancient cultures has advanced. A major obstacle to those who wish to study the Book of Abraham more closely, however, is the fact that this scholarship spans decades, is scattered throughout multiple venues, including books, journals, videos, podcasts, uh, conference proceedings, and so forth, uh, and is sometimes very technical. This can make matters daunting for some Latter-day Saints who wish to get a firm grasp on this material. To remedy this, in 2019, Book of Mormon Central, a nonprofit research foundation dedicated to making the Book of Mormon accessible, comprehensible, and defensible to the entire world, 
launched an initiative called Pearl of Great Price Central with the aim in part to collect, synthesize, and popularize scholarly work on the Book of Abraham in order to provide uh, study resources for Latter-day Saints and others who wish to enhance their engagement with this book of scripture. In August 2019, Pearl of Great Price Central launched a series of short essays called Book of Abraham Insights that highlighted some of the more noteworthy convergences between the Book of Abraham and the ancient world. It also explored how, how Joseph Smith's interpretations of the facsimiles in some ways harmonize with modern scholarship and provided an overview of what is known about the coming forth and translation of the Book of Abraham. The insights were kept deliberately short so as to not overwhelm readers with sometimes very technical and arcane information about ancient languages and cultures, while also remaining well-documented and rigorous and providing a bibliography for those wishing to dive deeper into these matters. In January 2020, Pearl of Great Price published its 40th Book of Abraham Insight before shifting its attention to Joseph Smith history in the Pearl of Great Price in anticipation for the April 2020 General Conference of the Church which had been designated by President Russell M. Nelson as a bicentennial celebration of the Restoration. It was at this time that the authors of the present volume, who were the principal, uh, present volume being this one here, uh, who were also the principal researchers behind the Book of Abraham Insights on Pearl of Great Price Central, uh, it was at that time we felt it would be appropriate to revise the insights to make them available in print. Accordingly, the subsequent months of the year 2020, when all of us had a lot of time in our hands in lockdown, uh, were spent revising the insights to incorporate feedback from readers, to update material in response to advances in scholarship, and to take into consideration constructive critiques uh, which we had received from readers. Uh, this material was first was uh, at first kept deliberately short, and new material uh, that couldn't appear in the initial print run uh, of the insights due to our time constraints and our publishing constraints was included in the printed volume. With the kind assistance and cooperation of John W. Welch and Stephen C. Harper, the former and current editors of BYU Studies Quarterly, respectively, we are pleased to find a new home for the final result of these revisions and expansions in the issue of the journal you see before you. And I understand that there are copies for sale at the bookstore, and it's also available, of course, online for free uh, at the BYU Studies website. As the name of this issue indicates, uh, and in keeping with the original purpose of the Pearl of Great Price Central's Book of Abraham Insights, while also building on that, our intention here with this book is threefold. First, we want to introduce readers to what past decades of scholarship on the Book of Abraham have already produced. Second, we want to guide readers through current issues, uh, through current trends and issues in Book of Abraham research that is currently unfolding. And third, we want to provide some new insights into the Book of Abraham as examples of where future scholarship can go. We therefore hope that we have a little bit of something for everybody, for all readers from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, those of you who may already be very well acquainted with Book of Abraham scholarship and those who may be encountering this scholarship for the very first time. Uh, it's for this reason that we beg, the, uh, we beg the pardon of those readers who are very well versed in Book of Abraham studies, you'll see that there's a lot of water that we retread in this issue. Uh, partly that's because, as I explained, uh, we wanted to make sure that everybody coming to the table would be on the same page. Um, but there is new stuff in here as well. Uh, there is uh, uh, new material as well, besides the stuff that we have done in the past. Part of our goal with this issue, which we have called uh, a guide to the Book of Abraham, is to review what we already know and we do not wish to leave readers confused who are just now encountering the Book of Abraham. And so for that reason, we felt it would be appropriate to retread some of the older work on this. Uh, the new volume, the content of the new volume, rearranges the organizational structure that was first laid out on the Pearl of Great Price Central website. So if you go to the Pearl of Great Price Central website, you'll notice some differences in the ordering of these essays versus what you'll get in the published version. Uh, that was done on purpose in order to create something of a more logical flow or progression throughout the contents. So the first section uh, of the book, of the issue of BYU Studies, is all about the coming forth of the Book of Abraham. Uh, it gives an overview of the coming forth and translation of the text in the 19th century. The second section, once we've covered uh, how we got the Book of Abraham, the second section is looking at the Book of Abraham in the ancient world, uh, and it provides an ancient and also a biblical context for the Book of Abraham and touches on points related to the historicity of, of the text. Uh, and in my personal opinion, that's my favorite part of the, of the book, uh, is looking at the actual text of the Book of Abraham and finding some very interesting ways to situate it in the ancient world 
and to find little insights and evidences for it from the ancient world. The third and final section is on the facsimiles of the Book of Abraham. Uh, this section looks at and focuses on the noteworthy instances where Joseph Smith's interpretations of the facsimiles uh, converge with modern Egyptological knowledge. Uh, these three interlocking issues are worthy of individual review and consideration since how the reader evaluates one of them will undoubtedly affect how he or she evaluates the other two. So depending on how you think about the coming forth of the Book of Abraham, that may very well influence how you evaluate its historicity, how you read the text, whether you approach it as uh, an ancient record from Abraham, a modern revelation from Joseph Smith, a modern pseudepigrapha from Joseph Smith, or something else. So the three issues are interlocking, and hopefully we're able to uh, thread them together to see our take on this. Because each of us, the authors, uh, has academic training in Egyptology and Near Eastern studies, we are conscientious of the balancing act that comes with, and pardon me, translating academic jargon and technical language uh, into a more comprehensible dialect for the non-academic but interested lay readers that we were writing for. This includes things like how to transliterate uh, ancient Egyptian and other languages, which sometimes requires the use of uh, technical characters that are not found in the English alphabet. Uh, because the arguments in this book sometimes relies on a very precise uh, knowledge or reckoning of the Egyptian language, uh, we decided to employ conventional scholarly uh, transliteration tools and other scholarly conventions um, in our arguments. Uh, so we hope that we don't drown you with some of the technical details in our arguments. We hope that they are still accessible. Uh, indeed, we hope that we have struck a proper balance between making our prose accessible and preserving uh, the scholarly rigor uh, and preserving scholarly rigor or accuracy. For readers who are eager to get into the more technical aspects of the issues that we cover in the book, uh, we advise that they follow our footnotes and also uh, our further readings at the end of each chapter. So each chapter will have plenty of footnotes for you to dive into, as well as further readings recommended at the end of it. It's our sincere hope that with a guide to the book of Abraham, uh, that it will equip seekers and honest questioners with the best, most reliable scholarly resources currently available and provide meaningful insights into this extraordinary scriptural text. Uh, I'm teaching a Pearl Gate Price class right now this summer uh, at BYU, and I, we just got done with the Book of Abraham, and it truly is an extraordinary text. Uh, it's a wonderful text. We hope that this work will serve as a reliable guide as we look back to see how far we have come in our understanding, as well as look forward to pursue new scholarly lines of inquiry that help us better understand the Book of Abraham in a variety of contexts, and thereby we hope also raise uh, appreciation for this book as sacred scripture and strengthen our faith in Joseph Smith as a modern seer and revelator. So that was the introduction or parts of the introduction uh, to kind of give you a flavor for the book. I want to read just a few more paragraphs from the conclusion of the book to again wrap things up and then I'll make a couple more comments and then I'll be happy to take any of your questions. The Book of Abraham is an inexhaustible source of exploration and critical investigation and the work of scholarly examination into this book shows no signs of slowing. On the contrary, we see multiple welcoming avenues for additional study. The net result of this review in the meantime, uh, and you'll just have to take my word for it until you get a chance to read the book, but the net result of the work done in this volume in the meantime has been the rediscovery of numerous points of convergence between the Book of Abraham and the ancient world and theological and narrative aspects of the book that invite more sustained investigation. We hope that our guide uh, will be helpful in orienting readers on these, uh, on these unrelated matters pertaining to the Book of Abraham, and that it suggests some ways in which we might make further academic progress. There is still, of course, much we do not know when it comes to how precisely Joseph Smith translated the Book of Abraham. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints itself takes no official position on this point other than to affirm that the translation was accomplished by the gift and power of God. And that is something that each of the authors, I feel I can speak for myself and my co-authors, that is something that we also individually affirm as well. Uh, there are remaining questions surrounding Joseph Smith's explanations of the facsimiles as well as the ancient world of Abraham. This guide does not presume to be an answer to all questions that people have or may yet have about the book of Abraham, uh, including its contents and the manner of its translation. We, of course, freely acknowledge that the tools of scholarship at this time do not confirm every claim made in or about the Book of Abraham, and we emphasize that the various lines of evidence explored in this book do not somehow prove that the Book of Abraham is true. 
We are, of course, well aware of the controversy that still surrounds the Book of Abraham, and we do not presume that this offering has once and for all settled the debate. But what we have seen, nevertheless, does help us plausibly situate the Book of Abraham in the ancient environment from whence it purports to derive, informs how we might approach the text going forward, and it positively affects our evaluation of Joseph Smith's claims to prophetic inspiration. Just as intellectual honesty demands, we acknowledge the remaining gaps in our understanding uh, and the ways in which the book of Abraham still lacks verification based on available evidence, so too does it demand that this positive evidence not be overlooked or ignored or dismissed out of hand or downplayed, even though it may be inconvenient for certain worldviews and ideological commitments. Although it should be evident, if you read the book, you'll see it's evident that we, the authors, tend to favor certain theories over others when it comes to explaining the nature of the book of Abraham. We do not presume to impose our understanding uh, on others as an article of faith. We are happy to acknowledge that Latter-day Saints can, in good faith, come to different conclusions about the nature of this book of Scripture um, and that they can pursue faithful study of the book of Abraham from different backgrounds and approaches. As a matter of fact, we welcome these different approaches and encourage a multitude of voices to contribute to the conversation. We also cheerfully embrace what Hugh Nibley articulated some time ago as an important strategy for any careful reader of the Book of Abraham. As Nibley so memorably expressed it, the key to approaching the Book of Abraham or any other scriptural work, for that matter, is to ask the right questions and keep looking. Future discoveries may bolster, qualify, or even undermine some of the points that we have raised in this volume. The special issue of BYU studies, like every other work of scholarship, has a shelf life and will one day need updating or replacement. Uh, a little side note about this quote from Hugh Nibley, uh, this was said at a Sunstone Symposium back in the 1970s. He was responding to, at the time, a young Latter-day Saint up-and-coming Egyptologist who had criticized some of Nibley's work on the facsimiles. And Nibley, some of you may have heard it or have read this talk of his, uh, he famously got up there and he said this, and then he also famously said, um, I refuse to be held accountable for anything I said more than four years ago, <laughs> right? This is an ongoing area of exploration. Hugh Nibley understood that, and we understand that as well. Uh, and we think that this is a good uh, foundation to build on as we continue to approach the book of Abraham and other scripture. Uh, but this we welcome, this attitude here, because we are confident that future generations of disciple scholars asking the right questions and answering those questions with the best available evidence will provide an even better case for the book of Abraham than what we have offered at this time with what we currently know. So there's my little uh, reading from the book to give you a flavor for it. Hopefully it's uh, uh, piqued your interest. Let me just wrap up with a few extemporaneous comments of my own, and then uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. So in summary, what have I uh, gained from this project I've been working on? Uh, and again, I encourage you to speak with John Gee and John Thompson for their perspectives as well. Um, but in my involvement with this project, here's some of the key takeaways that I uh, uh, have gotten from this. First of all, uh, the scholarly work on the Book of Abraham continues at full pace. Uh, it's full steam ahead for Book of Abraham studies, and there are many promising avenues for future study. So the last word has not been said on this subject, uh, and it's something that I'm excited for and the others are excited uh, to keep pursuing. Uh, one thing I've discovered is that the Book of Abraham holds up really well under scrutiny. Uh, by my reckoning, the Book of Abraham has been scrutinized and criticized, uh, I mean seriously scrutinized by scholars uh, with Egyptological backgrounds since at least the 1860s, uh, when Egyptology was still sort of a, a budding discipline. So since at least the 1860s, the Book of Abraham has been scrutinized, and I'm here to tell you that it holds up pretty well. Uh, if this, much like with the Book of Mormon, if this was a book that Joseph Smith was just making up, uh, we should have seen it fall to shambles by now. Um, but when you look closely at it, it doesn't. It holds up well under that uh, academic critique or that scholarly critique. The Book of Abraham, and I want to really emphasize this, the Book of Abraham rewards you when you give it careful, repeated, sustained, close reading and study. Um, the the go-to metaphor I like to use with my students and others is when you when you pop the hood open, you look at what's in the engine, it's really awesome. It's like a Maserati engine or something, right? Uh, it's great. Reading the book of Abraham closely with a sustained, careful eye 
Uh, it's a very rewarding exercise. And one of the main problems I see with a lot of criticisms of the Book of Abraham or misunderstanding of the Book of Abraham, perhaps, these days, stems from the fact that a lot of people don't read it very well. I can't think of a more polite way to say that, but you see this in academic literature all over the place, and it's really too bad, because if you were to read it better, you would have a good time with it. Uh, I freely acknowledge and confess even that at this time, we cannot answer all of the questions that people have about the Book of Abraham with our current data. So as I said, I'm not here to say that we have proven the Book of Abraham beyond any problem or beyond any question, that we've settled the debate. Uh, I freely acknowledge that I have questions that I can't yet answer, and that's okay, because uh, with those questions, I just keep looking and keep studying. And uh, so far, the trend has been very positive to find answers to my questions. Uh, but just so that nobody here misunderstands or has the misperception, um, I'm not trying to say the debate is somehow settled. On the other hand, however, and this also bears worth repeating, um, it is simply dishonest to claim that there is no positive case to be made for the Book of Abraham uh, or for its authenticity, or that Latter-day Saints, right, the Mormons are without a prayer when it comes to the Book of Abraham. You kind of hear this narrative. That's simply dishonest. And I'm going to be pretty adamant about this. You hear it all the time. It's very common and very easy to put forward this narrative, but it's just not true. Um, as a matter of fact, I would even go so far as to say that, uh, if not all, many or most of the criticisms of the book that people have leveled at it over the decades have uh, been satisfactorily answered or, or have been answered well enough with the data that we have on hand. And so if you hear somebody, whether it's somebody on social media or somebody you know in person or whatever, uh, and whether that person has the most impeccable Egyptological degrees you can have or whether they're just some random person on the internet, uh, no matter who they are, if they tell you this, they're not being honest to the evidence uh, because we do have a leg to stand on and there's a lot that we can say that's positive for the Book of Abraham. Last but not least, uh, and this is sort of my, I guess, my rallying cry as, as I finish up here. Uh, we as Latter-day Saints, we can look to the Book of Abraham with confidence in both its authenticity and its inspiration. Uh, the Book of Abraham is not like the awkward red-headed stepchild in the family, right? No, the Book of Abraham is a remarkable, inspired book of scripture, and we as Latter-day Saints can look to it as a remarkable and a profound, inspiring book of scripture. And so that's all one of the... Uh, one of the main things I gained from working on this project with my colleagues. So that's it. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll be very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Great. I can't imagine, I can't imagine anybody has any questions about the Book of Abraham, right? So I, I think we should just be good to go. No. Please share your favorite new finding. That's so some of the best new findings, in my opinion, come from, as I was saying, a close, sustained reading of the Book of Abraham, right? So, for example, um, there's two times when the name Jehovah is invoked in the Book of Abraham. And those are both in ritual settings, in ritual contexts. Uh, one in Abraham chapter 1, one in Abraham chapter 2. And they are invoked, and we have a chapter on it uh, in the book, they are invoked in contexts that make sense for a time in an ancient ritual context when you would invoke the name of a deity. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody else had sort of noticed that insight before, so that was fun to discover. Uh, there's also fun little tidbits. For example, uh, a new little piece of information we have in here is about the name of the sun given in Abraham chapter 3, Sheneha or Sheneha, right? Um, so John Gee gets credit for sort of putting us on this track. It was, it was at a fair conference, actually, all the way back, I want to say 2009. Um, he had pointed to some Egyptological liter uh, literature that seemed to point to the existence of this thing called Shani Necha in, in uh, ancient Egypt. It's the sun's ecliptic. So as the sun is passing through the sky, the path that it takes through the sky, right, you can track it. Uh, that's called uh, Shen Necha or Shani Necha in Egyptian. Um, John Gee pointed this out uh, sort of as an offhanded comment in his fair talk back in 2009. And I looked into it a little further, and sure enough, and so we have a chapter on Shaneha, the sun. That's so this random word in Abraham 3, but it seems to have a plausible Egyptian attestation. So that's another fun little finding we have in there. Um, like I said, uh, a lot of the book is us sort of revisiting stuff we've known before and sort of beefing it up, but there are some fun new things in there as well. Uh, Shaneha, stuff about Kolob that's pretty fun. Everybody has a fun Kolob theory, right? We've got a fun Kolob theory in the book, so uh, if you're interested in that, you know, you can check that out. So... Uh, yeah, but offhand, those are two that come to mind. So, 
do you vote for keeping the the collab song in the hymn book when they revise their, their book? Not only do we want to keep the collab song, I want more collab songs. This is true. This is true. Latter Day Saints have been obsessed with collab as like a thing in poetry and, and hymns. Lots of collab songs have been written by Latter Day Saints, not just the one by William Phelps. Uh, shout out to uh, Mormoner.org, the B. H. Roberts Foundation. We have an article on collab where uh, yours truly and others we compiled these original sources. I'm telling you, Latter-day Saints in the 19th century loved Kolob. And so, yes, uh, I want more Kolob in the hymn book, not less of it. That's good. So we have our Latter-day Saint Egyptologists, and do they, as a group or individually, do they prefer the missing papyrus theory, the catalyst theory, or something else? And then what is your preference? Great question. We, t we tackle both of those sort of perspectives in the book, and we try to fairly lay out the arguments for and against in both ones. Um, I think it's safe for me to say that my, I can speak for my colleagues and I that we all believe that Joseph Smith actually translated an Abrahamic text. Uh, we actually believe that there was a copy of Abraham's writings contained in the Egyptian papyri that Joseph Smith uh, came into possession of in July of 1835. However, with that said, um, he would have translated that text by revelation. And so he would not have done what the four of us did and slog through grad school to learn Egyptian and things like this, right? Uh, Joseph Smith would have translated that text by revelation. And so even if you posit the existence of a copy of Abraham's writings in the Egyptian papyri that Joseph Smith in some one-to-one -one corresponding matter translated, even if you say that, you have to acknowledge that he is operating in the revelatory realm. And so that means that he is operating in the, the sort of the world of the catalyst theory, where he still is receiving inspiration or revelation as to its contents. And so in some ways, I think you can sort of collapse the two categories together. You can perhaps make a hybrid or synthesized version of them. This is one area that there still needs to be a lot of good thinking and work done is the, the actual sort of the mechanisms of translation of the Book of Abraham. Um, but I think my authors and I, I can speak for them. We all believe there was a ancient copy of Abraham's writings on the papyrus uh, that Joseph translated by revelation. And beyond that, it's hard to say much more. Okay, excellent. Um, the... What do you think is the strongest evidence of the Book of Abraham's historicity, historicity? So I don't know if I could point to just sort of one little piece of evidence, right? Um, so my old BOE professor, Mark Wright, who I believe was here today, I think he's still here. When Mark Wright and I were talking about this with the Book of Mormon, and I asked him sort of the same question, like, hey, Mark, what do you think is like the best evidence for the Book of Mormon, right? He said, it's death by a thousand cuts. It's a lot of little things that pile up that make this thing look very persuasive and good. And so that's sort of my overall attitude with the Book of Abraham. It's not just like one smoking gun thing that we have. If I had to pick one or two things, perhaps, um, I think the mention of the place named Olashem in Abraham 1 is probably the Book of Abraham's Nahum. It, it probably arises. Not, it's not as good as Nahum. Nahum's pretty good. And shout out to Neil Rapley here. Go bug Neil Rapley about Nahum if you want to know more about it because he could talk your ear off. Uh, but Olashem, so this is uh, mentioned in Abraham chapter 1, where Abraham just kind of offhandedly mentions that in the land of the Chaldeans where he is, there is this place, uh, it's called the plain of Olashem, right? It's this place name, it's like around verse like uh, 10 or 12 or something. Um, we probably have that attested in Akkadian sources from the time of Abraham. Um, like it's, it's really interesting. The problem is we can't nail down where it is. Where is this Olashem, right? Uh, we have a, probably a general sense, but we can't be so sure like with Nahum. That's getting pretty good, though, in my opinion, because the texts where the mention this place, Olashem, in the Akkadian sources, I think the earliest one was uh, published in 1922, I want to say, or discovered in 1922 and published in 1928. Um, since then, there's been more sources, but that's kind of the big one people look to. So uh, read the chapter in the book about Olashem, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So you don't think that Joseph Smith picked it up with his studies in Dartmouth when he was five years old then? Probably not, and he probably didn't get it from Adam Clark. I know that's the big guy everybody likes to talk about today. Yeah, I, I would probably bet not. No. Nope. Probably not. Okay. Um, last question then. In terms of disaffection from the church, do you think the Book of Abraham is becoming more salient or less salient? That's a good question. I can only sort of speak anecdotally because I know there have been some studies of questionable utility and value that cite the book of Abraham as one of like the main things that people will leave the church about, right? So anecdotally, I can say, of course, that I know plenty of people who have come to me with concerns of the book of Abraham. And um, if you want another really depressing exercise, so we saw the presentation earlier about how depressing Mormons are portrayed in media. Yeah, go Google or go look on YouTube book of Abraham and see what I'm talking about, right? Like, so 
yeah, certainly it still is a, it's a really popular selling point for critics of the church. Um, and I think that's because it is such an easy narrative to package and sell. And it's a really hard one to kind of disentangle and deconstruct and show people why it's actually not that big of a slam dunk like critics think it is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, to my recollection offhand, uh, there's been serious criticism of the Book of Abraham since the 1860s. It's not going to go away. Uh, the narrative is just too good for people that want to dunk on the church, so it's going to be there. Um, but hopefully stuff like what we're doing here can turn the tide a little bit or at least give somebody an alternative narrative to look at. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily want to say that the Book of Abraham is like the thing that's causing people to leave or causing disaffection. Uh, anecdotally, perhaps you can see examples of that, but uh, beyond that, I'm not sure how much I could say definitively. I know I had a discussion with someone recently who was leaving the church over the CES letter, and they said, but 12 Egyptologists said that, and I said, like, well, that was in the 19... Yeah, from 1912. Uh-huh. 1912, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I'm sure it's really up to date. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate your time. Great. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it.